and think of the thousands, tens of thousands of people who are in Chicago, in LA, in Frisco, all over the US and internationally. And uh, I love it when I heard about Shannon Airport. You all know about Shannon is the stepping off departure point for goods and troops headed to the Middle East. So there's a huge protest in Ireland today. Uh, in other countries, Calcutta, Bangladesh, Rome, I mean, we're not alone. We are part of this whole. So, welcome. Uh, who we are, first of all, uh, my name is Will Thomas. I'm a member of Veterans for Peace, very proud of that. And my colleague, come over here, Richard. We should introduce ourselves a little bit. And then Mark, we're gonna let you in here, and Corey. Uh, why don't you give a short, oh, and Barbara, sorry. So, Barbara, introduce yourself. I'm Barbara, Barbara, Marcus, Veterans for Peace. And I'm Richard Murphy, Veterans for Peace, a Vietnam War veteran. And that's, Good to be here. And that shirt you're wearing on the back, Vietnam veterans and Vietnamese people still dying from Agent Orange. We cry out justice for all Agent Orange victims, especially the Vietnamese who have suffering even longer. Spring uh, on our crops in the U.S. now. Spring on our toxins, you mean. <coughs> Monsanto? Do I hear Monsanto? Monsanto. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And what are we doing about it? Nothing. Nothing. Again? Well, okay. Uh, I'm Will Thomas uh, from uh, Auburn and retired high school teacher who, uh, when my students always ask me, when they said, uh, you know, uh, they found out I was a veteran, did you serve in Vietnam? And I said, no, but I almost served in World War III. And uh, they said, well, what's that? And I'd say, well, you know, we're going to get to that eventually during my U.S. history classes. Uh, it had something to do with Cuba and uh, something to do with nuclear missiles and, and, and something to do with shipping them into uh, this island 90 miles away from Miami. And by the way, isn't where the Republican Convention? No, it's Tampa, right? <laughs> okay, not Miami. But anyway, but Veterans for Peace is having their convention in Miami about the same time, Richard Barber, uh, as the Republicans are meeting. Anyway, all right, I digress. So we know that the U.S. discovered these missiles were in Cuba. Uh, we know that General, ever hear of Curtis LeMay? Yeah. Yeah. LeMay. Yeah. Bombs away. Bombs away, LeMay. Yeah. Hey, by the way, I forgot to ask, how many other vets are here? All right, all right. Yay. How many uh, uh, non-veterans who are supporters of peace and justice are here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how many FBI agents are here? <laughs> all right. Just, right here? No, okay. Just wondering. All right. Uh, so here we are. We're, we're, we're thinking about Cuba. We know Kennedy uh, has got a cool head. Uh, we know that Khrushchev has a cool head, by the way. Oh, yeah. So these two work out a compromise to avert World War III. Yippee, because I was 19. I didn't think I'd live to see my 20th birthday. Wow, it's great. And there was a compromise. Now we're faced with a situation in the year 2012 where there's a possibility, there is a real possibility of a world war. When you hear that China gets 22% of its oil from Iran, and you hear about the assassinations of these Iran
Iranian scientists, physicists, nuclear engineers, some of them, when you hear about mosques being blown up in Iran, and, and uh, you, you are familiar with the floating ship we've got over there now in the Straits of Hormuz, stocked with friends of yours, Richard, special forces. And what about our troops going back into Australia? And, uh, well, yeah, that's to keep tabs on China. And the Philippines. And the Philippines. So, you know, you've got the three aircraft carriers there. You've got... Um, uh, Iran is surrounded by... What is it now? How many? 40 plus bases. I thought it was 37. And 14 countries. I mean, think of it. Turkey, Iraq, Afghanistan, Saudi, Saudi Arabia. We're back in Saudi Arabia, apparently. Uh, Oman, uh, Bahrain, which is the the uh, headquarters for the Fifth Fleet. I mean, stop and think about this. The drones flying overhead. You know, it's like we want to provoke them into doing something. And I hope they don't take the bait. But anyway, okay, so all of you have the guidelines on non-violence that were passed out. Arnie Alpert, you all know, uh, uh, we asked him for that and we, we thought so important that these be passed out because we are non-violent. We believe in non-violence even though some of us were combat veterans. Okay, um, Mark, you're looking at me like you want to say something now or later? Now? Okay, okay. So we are here today. Oh, and the, and the militarists in our own country and uh, our Congress, and they're not just all Republicans, you know. <laughs> uh, and, and yet, we, we have a president, I'm not sure, mixed signals about telling Israel, hold on, or hold off. I mean, we're saying today, hands off. Hands off. Let's, let's negotiate. Let's do diplomacy. You know, that's an unused word today in our government. We have a militarized foreign policy. Anyway, um, by the way, I might say hands off to the Palestinians as well, but that's another issue. Uh, hands off to the Palestinians? Hands off, Israel hands off the Palestinians. Yeah, the Palestinians hands off Israel as well. Well, we're not going to debate that issue today. No, then we should. Well, we're not here. It's not unilateral. It has to go both ways, or we ought to butt out. Well, we're we're involved, believe me. But let, let's talk about Iran. Okay? Let's talk about Iran, and let's not talk about Israel unless we're going to talk about the entire issue. Well, we're going to say let's let's say hands off to not just Iran. Let's say hands off to Iraq. We're still there. Hands off to Afghanistan. Yes. Hands off to the world. That's where we're at. Look, we've got 850 military bases at least overseas. Wow. Chalmers Johnson great book called Blowback, The Sorrows of Empire. Uh, what was the other one? How many military bases do you have in Israel? Uh, I don't know. I do. None. Well, okay, fine. But we give them all the money that they can use to... Defend themselves. Well, this is not a... Yeah. This is not but that's yeah. my point. Okay. That's not what we're here that, But that's my point. I think we need to stick to our issues and butt out of Israel's well, issues. Well, if you came here for Israel... Uh, I came here to see, in the hopes of seeing that we stick to an agenda that I can endorse. Otherwise, I'm blocking and I'm going home. I'm serious. Well, okay, but we're, we're here that. to say we don't want World War III. I agree. We don't want our troops getting involved, our people, and killing more people like we did in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I also don't want more than half the international budget going to defense. But well, we can't here, take here. care of our own people. Here, here. Stick to the common denominator. Okay. So stick to the common common denominator. Okay, all right. But I'm saying we have troops in 142 <laughs> nations out of 192. We have special operations forces in over 70 countries. These are the Pentagon figures, not mine. Okay? And Chalmers Johnson. And, uh, okay. So, and, and Richard uh, agrees in our, we're, Barbara, you have our statement of philosophy, I think. Yeah. One of the points is we will not interfere or intervene in the affairs of other countries. And unfortunately, that's been our history, particularly since World War II. Okay? So, uh, Will Hopkins could not be here. Uh, he, he recommended a quiz, and I think, Corey, you have that. But before we get to the quiz, you have? 
Oh, you do have one. I might have one somewhere. You right. do have it in the car. Right. The quiz on Iran. Well, this would be a good time, maybe. Mark, you wanted to say a few things, didn't you? So well, here for, uh, you know, similar reasons. So I don't see any reason why uh, anybody can't come up. Uh, I'd like to speak uh, on the issue of uh, United States militarism and its relationship to the economy. Uh, you know, the, the term bang for the buck was phrased immediately after World War II at the beginning of the Cold War in 1948. And it was a general referring to the fact that many people in the government at that point had a pretty good memory of the preceding 10 years before World War II. And they felt with the end of World War II and the government spending that the economy was going to go into a sp death spiral again, just like the previous 10 years. So, there's N NSC 68, the National Security Council 68, in 1948 it was signed and it's basically the global document for US militarism and the long story the short story really is that this military system over time has undermined our economy first and foremost because it's not labor intensive anymore there are less people actually working in the military than ever before but yet the money that is appropriated by the military continues to increase it's a completely market free system um, none, none of the, none of the uh, normal characteristics of a market system. Uh, bilking is pretty commonplace, and uh, we we had about th under 300 under 300 billion dollar annual spending when Bush came to office. Bush Bush Jr. came to office. It's about 287 a billion spending. It was increased to around 500 to 600 billion. It stayed that way for the entire decade, and for that. We only further undermined our security. We killed numerous civilians abroad. We've undermined our economy. And we've even undermined our democratic governments and our civil liberties. The US military system is undermining everything we value in this country, from a stable economy to sound minds, to a moral core of moral conscious to even habeas corpus. And uh, it seems now with this drum beat against Iran, it couldn't come at a more opportune time for the Western elites faced with an economy not different from the one that was preceding World War II. Uh, there seems to be a Great Depression in every country and a global awakening to the fact that many people in their own countries have been sold out by their elites and they appropriate most of the income. And now that the focus is targeted on them, They'll try to do anything to take that focus away from them and scapegoat people. It's a very, very familiar historical theme, and we have to be very vigilant against that. Uh, people don't want to know that, you know, our real enemy may not be abroad, and it's certainly not a country that hasn't attacked anyone in 200 years. You know, we have people say that Iran is instigating, but I've never seen an Iranian ship off American waters. I can't remember the last time Iran attacked anyone. 300 years. <laughs> so I personally don't have much knowledge of Iran, but I do know those things I just said, and that's enough to say that we have no in involvement. And, uh, you know, we're, we already are involved in a covert war and sanctions, and it's the, uh, the drumbeat that's concerning us all here. So, uh, you know, in the general context and the war, I think we need to make a dramatic turnaround in this country. We need, a, we need to end this national security state. Thanks. Yes. Okay. So I think Corey has the quiz All right. that will indicate, uh, I think, our knowledge or lack of uh, regarding the situation uh, you want to concerning. Read the answers? We'll ask the well, you read the answers. You ask the question. We'll we'll ask we'll folks ask, we'll for answers. Yes. Okay. All right, I'm, I'm Corey Hughes. I'm, I am an occupier. I, we do occupy the North Country. Um, but before we were occupiers, we were peace activists. Um, and it became uh, an, an issue, a really big issue for us as a family when my son-in-law was killed in Iraq in 2007. So um, I'm speaking now not just as an occupier and a, a, you know, a supporter of what um, New Hampshire Peace Action and um, and the Veterans for Peace do, but also as a part of Gold Star Family Speak Out. Uh, here's the Iran quiz, because we sure don't want to send our, our people into a situation that doesn't have to be. Uh, Iran.
Grant, who is the real threat? Speak up. Question one. What country in the Middle East refuses to confirm or deny that it has nuclear weapons program and refuses to sign the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty? Israel. 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 Is that right? Yeah. Israel. Yeah. It is, according to the answer sheet here. <laughs> yes. Israel, Pakistan, and India have not signed the treaty. Israel does not publicly admit it has nuclear weapons, although the fact that it does is common knowledge. Iran has signed the treaty and does not have a nuclear weapons program. And that's certified by the 16 defense intelligence agencies, including even Panetta, the secretary of defense. It's an open secret, everybody knows. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hey, question two. What country agreed to be monitored by the International Atomic Energy Agency and has repeatedly opened up its country to IAEA inspectors? Iran. Iran is the right answer, yes. Question three. Which country's prime minister has been attempting to persuade members of his cabinet to make a preemptive military strike against a neighboring country? Israel. Israel, according to the information here. Question four. The International Atomic Energy Agency and the U.S. have provided evidence that Iran is attempting to obtain nuclear weapons. Is that true or false? True yeah, or false. that's a true or false, sorry. Uh, no, false. Uh, yeah, it is false. Neither have provided any evidence that Iran is attempting to obtain nuclear weapons. No evidence. Question five. The IAEA severely criticized which country for falsifying information on Iraq and Iran's nuclear program? What's IAEA? You know that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the United States, yeah. We're guilty. Okay. The IAEA is the International Atomic Energy Agency. Can you read the question again? Yes. The IAEA severely criticized which country for falsifying information on Iraq and Iran's nuclear program. Tribunal, what is the gravest war crime of all? Attacking a country. Yes. Attacking a country which hasn't attacked you. This is called a war of aggression, which contains within itself the accumulated evil of the whole. That is in parentheses. Okay, question seven. This is the last one. Which is the one country on the planet which has actually used nuclear weapons against the civil, civilian United population. United States. United States of America. Which bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, during World War II, killing between 150,000 and 246,000 um, people within just the four months, half of them within the first 24 hours. It was unnecessary. Guys. It was, yes. yes. Uh, this, this quiz comes from the world can't wait uh, .net, and they say, how did you answer these questions? How do you think many Americans would answer these questions? In addition to sanctions, there have been targeted assassinations, as we know, as we mentioned, of Iranian nuclear scientists, and that drone that somehow found its way into Iran uh, Let's be clear, no matter what you think about the government of Iran, the real aggressor, according to the world can't wait, in the Middle East is Israel and the United States. They're crying for, out for no war, no sanctions, no interventions, no more assassinations, no assassinations. Now, the oil embargo, uh, you know, the EU has decided that they will not purchase any oil uh, that comes from Iran. Uh, I don't know if you knew, I didn't know, that Greece, Spain, and Italy receive a lot of their oil from Iran. Uh, last time I checked, those countries were economically pretty much basket cases. So what will this do for 
those countries. And in terms of Western Europe, they're going to need oil. They get a lot of it from Libya. Um, I think the Russians are going to make out quite dearly by selling their oil to Western Europe. Uh, how will the Chinese respond if Iran is attacked when they get 22% of their oil from Iran? I mean, I see Russia, uh, China, and Iran lining up on one side, and then, and I'm thinking, by the way, of 1914, prior to World War I, and I see UK, US, and Israel lining up on the other side. And I'm thinking, I've seen this play before somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why we're here, that's why I'm here, and I'm glad you're here, because we don't want, we don't need another war. Right. Let's take our money, let's spend it, as Dr. Martin Luther King said, on life-affirming activities. Let's have more money for our schools, our education. Let's provide health care for everybody. Let's have a affordable housing. Let's rebuild our bridges, our roads. Let's help people instead of killing them. That's what we're saying. Uh, I guess what what to do. People always ask me what what to do. Well, I, I know a lot of you know what to do. Uh, besides the general, you know, right contact. Uh, Senator Shaheen, Senator Ayotte, Congress, uh, Congressman uh, Bass and Ginta. Uh, what else could you do? Stop paying taxes. Stop paying your taxes. War tax resistance, right? Uh, go, hey, how about going to the office of these people and occupying it for a couple hours? We do. Non-violently. Sit down and have a dialogue with their chief staffer uh, and, uh, you know, maybe do it more than once. Yes, we so do. They, we do yeah. it every chance we get up in the North Country. Right, so. Corey, you might got to mention uh, you part of Gold Star Mothers. A Gold Star Family. A Gold Star family. Families, yeah. right, as well. Uh, that's important. Yeah. Their voices are uh, important. Uh, what else? Uh, you know, Dave, Dave Tiffany, yeah. and Peter. Popular idea. That's what? Oh, starting. Popular idea. Everybody likes it. Could be. Uh, Peter and Dave Tiffany are here. We vigil every Thursday uh, from noon to one, and one of our fellow vigilers died two weeks ago, uh, Beryl. And Beryl would write postcards, and she was 80, right, 80, 81? She would write postcards all the time, dozens and dozens and hundreds, and take them personally to Senator Gregg's office and then Senator Ayotte's office and others. And, you know, she got to know the people there, and they got to know her. Too bad it didn't impact enough. Right Judge Gray. Writing to your representatives does no good at all. Huh? Writing to your representatives does no good at well, all. Well, it doesn't. I get form letters back. They don't I do too. I, wrote. I do too. We all do. But, but enough of us do it. You know. So run for office. Run for office. Right. That's another good. That's another good idea. Run for office. Um, petitions are good. But uh, somebody said to me. Well, I heard Brian Wilson. Brian Wilson, Vietnam vet, who wrote a great book called Blood on the Tracks. Anybody know? Not the singer Brian Wilson. Beach Boys? No, not him. Uh, ask Brian Wilson. Uh, he was the guy who decided to stop a train uh, of, of weapons that were going to Central America to support the, the right-wing uh, dictators we were supporting. Uh, opposing the the uh, campesinos, farmers, teachers, union organizers, professors, priests, and nuns. And Brian and others said, we can't allow this. So symbolically, they sat down on the tracks to stop the train. And unfortunately, the train sped up. And the others jumped out of the way. Brian didn't. He couldn't. And so his legs were sliced off. And he nearly died. And his skull was crushed. It's a, it a plate in his skull now. He recovered and has now been, well, a full-time peacemaker, of course, activist. And I'd recommend the book, Veterans of Peace. He's a member of Veterans of Peace. Brian Wilson called Blood 
on the tracks. <laughs> the Life and Times of S. Brian Wilson. It's a powerful book. Okay. It took him 11 years to write. Yeah. He said it could have gone further. You know, Brian's down here, like five, six, 600 pages, right? But he's a great guy. Um, so uh, he mentioned during the build up to the war in Iraq, where were the churches? Where were the rabbis, the ministers, the priests, the Buddhists, uh, the Unitarians? Where were they? And they didn't speak out for the most part. So it's up to us if we belong to a congregation, a temple, uh, um, you know, a church, a Catholic church, or, or whatever, Protestant church, grassroots, you know, get to that priest or minister or rabbi through the grassroots and say, you've got to preach out, you've got to speak up. Now, we know politically they don't want to do that because they're going to lose their tax exempt status, they're going to lose perhaps money and support. It's difficult for some of these people to speak out. But it's, I thought they were for, you know, the right thing to do. Yeah. I mean, you know, any religion, you know, treat people as you would be treated. And right now, that's not happening. So that's why I'm a, I'm a recovering Catholic. <laughs> I, I really am. I mean, you know, I just don't, well, I won't go there. But <laughs> anyway, so we're gonna invite anybody else who would like to speak uh, on this issue. Come on up and have your Anybody? Tax resistor? Are you, are you not paying your taxes? Do you make enough to pay taxes? Okay. Yeah. Uh, you're not related to Mitt Romney, are you? <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> you can, you can talk. I think it's important to learn how to talk to people who disagree with us on this issue. It's hard to understand how somebody could support war but everybody has reasons. And as somebody who identified as politically conservative for years, um, and somebody who supported the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan for way too long, I can testify as to some of those reasons and why I changed my mind. You can't be afraid of dialogue. Every person who disagrees with you has a brain, whether or not you can tell that for yourself. Um, as far as talking to the right about war, I would suggest um, bringing up that as that war is a government program and as such has unintended consequences. Um, it has all of the pitfalls of any domestic program and um, encourage them to think of the ways that domestic programs fail in their minds and see that all of those issues, uh, opportunity cost, misplaced incentives, all of those things apply to war. And I'm ashamed to admit this, but I used to value American lives more than non-Americans' lives. And I think that's a very natural human thing. It's a tribal thing um, to support the in-group and care about the in-group and devalue the outsiders. But you need to appeal to everybody's basic human goodness and say, if you're honest with yourself, there is no difference between an American's life and an Iranian's life. You can't, you can't just look away from the carnage and think, well, you know, there's collateral damage. Because if there were bombs falling here, you would not call it collateral damage. You would call it a tragedy 
and you would scream and tear your hair out and say, no, this has to stop. You really have to put yourself in other people's shoes. So when I talk to the right, those are some of the things I say. And I encourage you to try them out for yourself because almost everybody can be won over. You just have to believe in their inherent goodness as a human being. Richard? And I ran, and who was involved? A lot of young people, a lot of students. They want freedom. They admire America. They like the American lifestyle. So why would we want to go over there and bomb them? I mean, it's like people that say, you know, bomb, bomb, I ran. They're not thinking about all the people that really like us and support freedom. You know, it's just the leadership over there is a little whacked out, but that doesn't mean the whole country doesn't want to be free. So, that's all I got to say. I'll just keep it brief. I'm, I'm Michael Joseph. I'm with Occupy New Hampshire, Occupy Manchester. Uh, I've known Will for many years. I stood by Will at many a discussion in the in the Teachers Association in Manchester when he was a little boy speaking up for some of these issues. The kind of thing that I think is important is uh, a, a, an example is that Will's going to the West Bank to work with a Christian group, and it brings my it brings my mind back to President Kennedy. Even though we did stand off to the to the Soviet missiles in Cuba had a more balanced approach, because what was the Peace Corps about? That was a first time thing. So what are we going to replace the warmongering with? You see, you, if you empty one end of it, you've got to fill it with something else. And when we go as Peace Corps members to other countries to teach them skills that they want to learn, it endears them to people. <laughs> who are teaching them, okay? So we are Americans, we are people, or, or even Europeans, people from Western Europe, people from the West, can go and help people to gain some of the skills, whether they be agricultural, technical, um, journalistic, whatever they may be, okay? And that's going to what, what's going to have the long-term effect. And, and, and uh, Bush Sr. was right in one thing. I could never agree with him on much, but the, the notion of a thousand points of light is a good one. And I think that's what we have to be, is a thousand points of light in molding people and helping people with their real needs. And that's how you make peace. It was called the Peace Corps. What was, it, what was its purpose? <laughs> peace. Okay? It was designed to head off issues that could lead to war. And we haven't. Well, I don't hear about it anymore. We've got to get back. I mean, it's still there. It exists. We've got to get back to it. Can I speak to that? Can I speak to that? Yeah. My son's in Afghanistan right now. My son's in Afghanistan right now on a humanitarian mission. Uh, he's been to others. He was in the West Bank. He was in Ramallah a couple of years ago on a humanitarian mission. And every time he goes into one of the world's hotspots, I worry about him because I'm his mother. Um, but this is what I brought him up to do, you know, is to do good in the world. He's an IT wizard and he specializes in uh, geospatial um, open source stuff. If you ever use Google Maps, you're using software, you know, like that. And it's open source and it's free. And he goes into the third world and he teaches local wannabe IT hotshots how to use simple software that you can download for free and, you know, your basic laptop to do stuff that will benefit their society. And he's in Jalalabad right now. He's in Kabul for a week teaching workshops. And then these young Ir Ir uh, Afghans took this stuff and they designed their own things. And one of the things that they designed, the one that won their contest, they had a, a project contest, was not something we would expect. It was an interactive program designed to resolve the conflict over who gets to go on pilgrimage to Mecca every year, because there are more would-be pilgrims than there are spaces. 
and it's not the sort of thing that we would anticipate they need, but for them it's a big need. I have no idea how they're resolving it now, but I'll bet it's not fair. And so this was an online, basically, lottery uh, called uh, Easy Hodge. Uh, and he's been taking meetings with uh, local groups. There are multiple uh, refugee aid groups, and no two of them have the same map. And he's proposing to help them coordinate so they all have one interactive map that they can all update together and be on the same page. And I'm hearing from so many vets, they all hate us, and they will always hate us. And what I'm hearing from him via his Twitter feed is, you know, going places with well, young Afghans, he's going to local you know, rug shops. Oh, you're a good Pashtun, they said to him last night in, in, in Jalalabad. And I'm thinking, there's a disconnect here. After how many, after how many years of military occupation there, how many years? How many years have we been fighting against them? Ten. Ten. They hate us and they'll always hate us. But when he went to Ramallah and when he's in Kabul and, and Jalalabad, dealing with people on a one-on-one -on -one basis and helping them resolve their own issues in ways that work for them. He's doing another program. If you have time, I'll tell you about it. Um, uh, it has to do with dropping cell phones and solar-powered chargers to teachers in the places in Afghanistan that are so remote that the teachers have no training and they can't get training to them. So by dropping them cell phones and chargers, they can give them a menu, a touchstone menu of teaching materials that, that are audio that they can listen to. And that helps bring the teachers up, upgrade the teachers so that they can transmit better information to their students. That's another thing that he's working on. And I guess what I'm trying to say is it's cheaper. It's cheaper. When I look around, I think, if I had a husband who was all over town spending money to help other families and my kids didn't have shoes and I couldn't get my teeth fixed, uh, I'd be angry. And I think my neighbors would be angry and they'd say, get the F home and take care of your own house before you go taking care of everybody else's. And if we are in so far in, in debt in this country and we're spending more than half our federal budget on Military. Military, I was going to say, on the, on the rest of the world's business, then I think we ought to bring it home, bring our kids home, train them to do much more low-tech, interpersonal stuff, because when, when what you said, when we go there and we relate to these people, person to person, one-on-one, -on -one, it's really afraid to go to a mom. Now, what was that word? He was a good, what did you say? Pashtun. What is that? Pashtun is one of the tribes in, in uh, I guess, eastern Afghanistan. He bought himself one of those freedom uh, fighter hats and he was, you know, he's, he's sitting there with the people, he calls them protégés, with well, the people that he's trained. He's sitting in front of a fire drinking scotch, is what he said last night. All I get is the tweets. I know so little. And so he tweets, someone just told me, I'm a good Pashtun. And I don't know, I don't know what that means. Well, I don't know when, what that means. When, when you Does that go, mean he looks like a good Pashtun or he's acting like a good Pashtun? I suspect it's the latter. I think a lot of the point is when you teach people, you can endear you. If you do it with sincerity Bingo. and truth and you're honest with them. And humility. You gain, you gain respect from people and uh, uh, admiration and whatever. And, and so this comes back to you. And this is how the world is supposed to be. And this program, <laughs> this is this program to, to upgrade the teaching materials in the, in the hinterlands of Afghanistan, $50,000 a year. Yeah. Can, I, can I just Very good. Yeah, I'm done. You made a great, thank you. You made a great point, though, about putting a human face on the Iranian people. And I don't know how many of you actually watch television or see uh, a travel series uh, uh, sponsored by, uh, well, the uh, leader is Rick Steves. Oh, yeah. Rick Steves. Yeah, yeah. Rick Steves. Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah. He, he uh, was asked from uh, by some friends that he should do one of these travel shows on PBS, although my friend Richard Murphy just left what was called PBS Pentagon Broadcasting System, you know, <laughs> like NPR was National Pentagon Radio. But, but Rick Steves, he was asked to go to Iran. And he said, well, I, I don't know, I do Europe, you know. I, no, no, you should do Iran. So he, he asked, it took him a while, but he got a permit. 
to go to a ranch to do one of his travel shows. And usually they're half an hour, but this was an hour. Yeah. And wow, you know, I got a free copy. <laughs> He's sending them out. And I showed it on our public access over here. And you're right, the children, the students, the business people. I mean, Ackman did a job. Granted, not a very nice fellow, <laughs> you know. The Ayatollah Khomeini, not particularly a good fellow. And by the way, you know, you know the reason why they have the Ayatollahs, right? The 1953 sure. overthrow of Mossadegh, the democratically elected leader of Iran, by the American CIA. <laughs> right. We also elect not very nice people in our democracy. <laughs> Well, but, but I'm going to recommend that people try and get a hold of that show uh, and show some of your maybe relatives who may be more hawk-like than you uh, to, to humanize, as you said, the, the Iranian people. You know, Rick Steves did a and, show and what, on Israel, too. And on and Israel. Israel. Oh, they made the desert blue, not a word about Palestinians. Yes. Well, not a word. But, but Mike's point all because he was on a path of peace, believe it or not. Uh, a book uh, written by an acquaintance of mine called JFK and the Unspeakable talks about Kennedy uh, pursuing a path of peace. Read his August uh, speech at uh, American University of 1963, maybe it's June, about getting rid of the world of nuclear weapons. Here we are, 2012, and we're trying to get Obama to... Right. So, J.F. Kenny Unspeakable uh, is, is, is the book. Uh, J.F.K. and the Unspeakable by James Douglas, with two S's. A, a fantastic book about the assassination and the path that he was on. Peace. Well, does anybody else have any, any other comments? Yes. Sir. Come on over to Gene. I should have mentioned Gene as a, as a member of Vets for Peace as well. And I wanted to say something that Will and I have known each other for years and we're Vietnam veterans and for the first four or five years of the Vietnam War there were more organizers than there were people. It was, well this is really a success, there's just quite a few people here, but just don't give up because we're going to win but you have to be in it for the long haul, you know, yeah. because it didn't happen overnight. For years went yeah, on, years, exactly. thousands and thousands of people dying. And, and the same with, the, it wasn't just Vietnam. I mean, it was the environment and civil rights and, and, and uh, women's liberation. And it's the same with now. There's a whole bunch of issues that if we keep hanging in there, we're going to really make a difference. That's exactly. all i got to say. All right, Gene. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Uh, Dave, I, I mentioned Beryl a few minutes ago. Uh -huh. And one of the ways that Beryl used our fellow vigilant who died Postcards and bringing them to uh, bring them to Kelly A. Ott's office uh, and Gene Shaheen's office. And Gene Shaheen's office. So that personal connection. Alright, Alex. I was gonna say, are you guys done? We're okay. about done. Yeah. Right. I want to flash them off the intersections during the walk sig signals. Uh, for fun. Okay. Describe it. <laughs> Doing what? All right. So the walk signal goes on, and everybody runs in the middle of the intersection and dances and shit. <laughs> over and over again, right? With dark signs? Okay. All right. <laughs> wait, wait. Yeah, we have music. We have music. Oh, yeah. Where are yeah. my drums? Yeah. I'll put it in my chair. <laughs> when the walk signal comes on, when the walk signal comes on, run into the middle of the intersection. Run into the middle of the intersection. And dance. And dance. That's it. Everybody dance. Dance. Dance.
Thank you.